Okay. So thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our book club. This is the first book club of our season. And we're very excited and, and honored this evening to not only have a book club about uh, the book Concealed, which we've all been reading and been excited to read, but our author is actually here with us today. So it's a special treat for us. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Esther Amini. Um, Esther is a writer, painter, and a psychoanalytic psychotherapist in private practice. Her recently released book, Concealed, is her debut memoir. Kirkus Reviews named Concealed one of the best books of 2020. Esther Amini's short stories have appeared in Elle, Lilith, Tablet, The Jewish Week, Barnard Magazine, TK University's Inscape Literary, Proximity, Paper Brigade, and Zibby Owens Anthology, Moms Don't Have Time To. Uh, Esther Amini was named one of Aspen Word's Best Emerging Memoirists and a, awarded its Emerging Writer Fellowship in 2016 based on her memoir, Concealed. Her pieces have been performed by the Jewish Women's Theater in Los Angeles and in Manhattan, and she was chosen by the Jewish Women's Theater as their artist in residence in 2019. Katie Couric and Zibi Owens selected Concealed as one of their 11 most favorite books, and together we'll discuss it on November 30th, 2021 at the Stryker Center in Manhattan. Uh, Chaiflix, which is like the Jewish Netflix, is presenting a streaming version of excerpts from Concealed called Amrika. I hope the, uh, the pronunciation is right. <laughs> Esther Amini lives in New York City with her husband, and we're very pleased and excited to welcome you today, Esther. So thank you so much for coming to be with us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am going to um, see if I can spotlight you for us. And Yes. And ask you, uh, could you give us a quick overview of your book, Concealed? Sure. Uh, I do have to give you a little background. Uh, Jews lived in ancient Iran, which was back then called Persia, for 2,700 years, uh, making them the oldest community in the Jewish diaspora. My parents my ancestors date back over 2000 years. So they came from Iran. Uh, my parents lived in the city of Mashhad. I was born in New York City uh, unto Jewish Iranian parents who came from the most fanatical Islamic city in all of Iran, that's Mashhad. Mashhad is a Shiite stronghold a pilgrimage site with a long history of maiming and massacring infidels. And an infidel is anyone who does not, who's not Muslim. The reason why Mashhad is such a holy city, the holiest in all of Iran, is because the ninth century Imam Reza is buried there. So millions of people from around the world come to Mashhad to pay homage to Imam Reza. Meanwhile, you've got my parents living in this city with a tight Jewish community, living as underground Jews, living as crypto Jews uh, for generations uh, of all places. I mean, this is where they were. And above ground, my mother wore the black chadr, which is the burqa, she looked through these tiny eye slits. The rest of her was cloaked in black, looking like all the other Muslims when she stepped out of the home. My father would pray from the Quran in the public squares uh, many times a day, side by side with other Muslims, appearing like them. And yet in the privacy, in the secrecy of their home, they were devout Jews. So this is a life of paranoia, duplicity, um, and duality. Uh, they had to live a dual life and not be their authentic selves for good reason. I mean, if they came out as Jewish, if they came out of the closet as Jewish, they would have been massacred. So you've got that background 
And it was right after World War II when my mother decided she'd had enough. And she yanked my father, my two brothers who were very young at the time, uh, and decided she's coming to New York where she has a brother, my uncle Aaron, living in New York and she's leaving Iran for good. And this was not an easy thing to do. Uh, firstly, this was in 19, let me get this right. This was in 1946 when she decided to leave. And uh, this is way before the Khomeini revolution, which was in the late 1970s. And it was a courageous thing to do. And it was very hard to leave Iran. You didn't go to Tehran and jump on Pan Am Airlines. There were no commercial flights. So it meant getting on horseback, donkey, mail trucks, getting into Afghanistan, and from there getting to India, and then trying to find a way out of India. Uh, and so it took them over a year to finally arrive in New York. It was quite an odyssey. There's a lot of humor in the book uh, because there's comic relief. And yet at the same time, there, there are a lot of dark moments. So they arrive and a few years later, I'm born. And that's where my story begins. Um, it begins with the fact that I am born in Queens. I, I'm born in New York. We, I grow up in Queens. Unto a family, unto a father in particular, who was tethered to Meshad. And so he brought with him the culture, com the, the complete culture, and wanted me to be raised the way his mother was raised. Um, and it creates a lot of difficulty. On the one hand, I was a very, I was a very quiet, uh, deferential child. And yet at the same time, I was, I was struggling with how to be American and at the same time, how to honor my parents. Um, and, and the book is really about navigating two opposing worlds. I felt like I was at the intersection of medieval Mashad and 20th century America, uh, caught between two opposing cultures. Uh, so that's the synopsis in short. Um, it was, it's a fascinating book and it's a fascinating place that you found yourself at that intersection. Um, can, you, can you speak a little bit uh, more specifically about some of the influences that Mashad had on you as you were growing up, uh, some, you know, some, some specific instances of sure. how that influenced your life? Sure. I mean, to get back to my father, he, um, he was a wonderful man in many ways, a man of integrity. Uh, but again, he believed in the culture he grew up in. So for example, his mother was married off at the age of nine to my grandfather who was 20 years older. So my grandfather, when she was nine, he was 29. That was the norm. That was the norm in Mashhad. My mother was 14 when she was strong-armed into marrying my father. This is all within the Jewish community. This is all underground crypto Jews. And she was forced to marry my father, who when she was 14, he was 34. Again, a 20 year age difference, the norm. So this is what my father knew. This is what he saw worked. According to him, it worked. Girls were also kept illiterate. Boys were not. Boys were taught to read and write. Girls were kept outside of classrooms. And the belief system at the time was that an uneducated girl would turn into an excellent wife, uh, that she would honor her husband, that she would not differ, she wouldn't have opinions of her own, and there'd be harmony in the home. So there was a whole philosophy behind all of this. Uh, and my father believed it worked. Uh, keep in mind, my mother was illiterate. She was never allowed to learn to read and write. And yet she had quite a voice and she was defiant and rebellious and outspoken and quite a character larger than life. 
and my father was withdrawn and sanctified silence. So you've got the clash of two cultures and you've got the clash of two parents who are diametric opposites and I was caught in between. Um, and so my father wanted me to marry young. My father want not at the age of nine, but certainly let's say by 15, 16, he thought that was, that was the time. Um, and he, he also didn't want me to go to school and he didn't want me to learn to read and write. So here I am born and raised in the United States where it's a law, you do have to go to school. So he realized that, but he tried to prevent me from bringing books home. And of course I was doing them secretly. It was like contraband. I was bringing in my books, hiding them under the mattress, reading with a flashlight at night under the covers, feeling like a criminal. Um, and uh, if he caught me, it would be, I, was, I would be devastated because he'd have a meltdown. Um, so this is what he brought with him. And um, meanwhile, I was growing up and had aspirations of my own, dreams of my own, um, and didn't want to be the way his mother was. And she was a lovely woman, but I didn't want her life. And that, that was how Mashad entered our living room. You know, he never left that city behind. He brought it with him. Wow. Well. Um, in the book, you're, you're, both of your parents are such huge characters and, and very large personalities, both of them. Your father, very rule-bound and had many rules for you, including silence. Meanwhile, your mother seemed to resist all rules and any, any artificial constraints. Uh, now that you're an, an adult, which of them would you say you're most like? I, I think I've got both of them in my chest equal proportion. For sure. Uh, when it comes to my father, uh, he, he really revered silence and forbade speech. So it was difficult. Uh, we three children would remain very quiet when he was at home, as quiet as possible. I spent a lot of time in my bedroom painting, which is something you can do quietly. It's soundless. Uh, reading secretly, which I could do soundlessly. And later when I had my own little diary, I would be writing soundlessly, basically turning inward and drawing from myself. And I think that became a very big part of me. Um, later in life, I did a great deal of painting and a lot of writing. And uh, I, I think that being able to live with myself in a quiet space has a lot to do with my father and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. On the other hand, my mother, she was, she was defiant. She, uh, she, she would counter uh, authority figures cultural expectations. She only believed in her own thoughts, in her own opinions, and was rebellious. Um, I can't say that's me, but I can say that her, there are aspects of her defiance that have become me. For example, writing this book was an act of defiance um, because I was defying Mashad. I was defying the culture my parents came from uh, by exposing the culture, by writing, which is something a girl is not expected to do, at least not from my parents' generation, from that city of Meshad. So I think I have both of them in me. Um, the book deals so vividly with the two clashing, clashing cultures uh, between Iran and America. And yet the story is told with so much love and humor. Often uh, the humorous sections are the ones that really seem to stand out as bringing your parents to life uh, and really bringing them into focus for us so that we can see them almost. I was wondering if you could give us an example and perhaps maybe even uh, a reading of uh, someplace in the book where you use that light touch to, to show us your parents through your words. Sure. 
Uh, I have a chapter that's called Rear View Mirror, and I'll read you a small section from it. Uh, keep in mind, my mother was illiterate, and my mother could not read or write, had never been educated. We are now in the United States, and uh, I, I, I'm, take, I'm, I'm extracting from the middle of the chapter. Unable to master the written word, mom decided she'd try her hand at driving. You behave like a man, my father yelled, grinding his teeth. This is not dignified behavior. This is not womanly. A woman should not drive a car. This cheapens you and brings dishonor to our family name. With her hands tightly squeezing her wide hips, and her nose snapping in the air, my mother retorted, I drive. She began taking lessons. Each morning, Mr. Goldschmidt, her driving instructor, pulled up in front of our gabled house. He was a 10 a.m. punctual man, short, stout, doubled over, and in his 80s, he'd help her into the passenger side of the front seat of his car and whisk off. Pop clutched his head as mom got ready to leave. You will murder a stranger crossing the street or end up killing yourself in a car accident. We will be dragged through courts and you will be thrown into prison. Your children need you, think of them. Undaunted, she with a May West strut headed out the door to meet Mr. Goldschmidt. Unable to stop her, Pop was reassured by the fact that mom could not read or write. He was certain she'd never be granted a license. He endured her lessons with Mr. Goldschmidt by counting on the brilliance of the American system. She'd fail all her written exams and be found out. But on her very first try, my mother passed her written and driving tests. To this day, I don't know how. And drive, she did, to Corona Queens to purchase her produce. But that wasn't all. On oppressively humid summer nights, after feeding her family, she turned to me and said wistfully, Esther, you want to go to airport? That was my cue. We would climb into the Valiant and take off to Idlewild Airport, later renamed John F. K. International. Riding up front next to her, I knew my life was at risk. For mom, rear view mirrors were used only to reapply lipstick. Side mirrors were for decoration. Entering and exiting frenetic highways, weaving in and out of curving lanes on Queens Boulevard and merging onto the Van Wick Expressway, my mother drove with the unshakable conviction that surrounding cars were all looking out for her. And as a result, she had nothing to worry about. Other drivers honked like hell, their hands simultaneously slamming their steering wheels and foreheads. Male middle fingers shot out of rolled down windows. In return, mom, with a carefree smile, waved back and continued to blissfully cut in and out of speeding lanes. Riding shotgun, in a time before seatbelts, reading signs to her, watching for other cars, head swiveling, nails digging deeper and deeper into the upholstery. I was her navigator, her co-pilot, and rear view mirror, shouting, not now, mom, wait, now, go. It was terrifying. And yet each time she asked, Esther, you want to go to airport? I went, I never said no. Driving was my mother's fix. With windows wide open, she sped along and sung to the blast of rock and roll radio like some daredevil teen. On steamy summer nights, as her hair blew every which way, she'd tell me to lift my arms, expose my armpits, and cool off in the wild wind. Mom's joyride peaked once she reached Idlewild. Gliding over ramps, racing from one airline terminal to another, recklessly flooring the gas pedal, 
We flew by Pan Am, TWA, Iceland Air, KLM, Swiss Air, and of course, El Al. Sailing over intertwining lanes, her face softened. The unobstructed cobalt sky was hers. Now that my father was nowhere to be seen. Likely she was flying her own private jet. On these summer nights, she rang a freedom. For an hour, mom cruised over every available ribboning ramp over and over again, jetting away into the can-do night before turning to me and saying, ready, go home? If she was, then I was too. That was wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I guess my next question is a sort of a personal one for you. Was it difficult for you to write this book? I, did you find the process of writing this book therapeutic? It was very difficult. It was very difficult writing it. Um, I had been thinking about it my entire life on one level or another, you know, as a child, as an adolescent, uh, the whole idea of who are they? Who am I? What is this all about? Um, there was so much I couldn't understand. Clashing of characters, clashing of cultures, growing up in the 1950s and 60s, and suddenly here in the United States, there's the sexual revolution, and my father is coming from medieval Mashhad. Uh, the things he said, the things he felt, and I tried to like integrate it all. Uh, so finally, after many years, I decided I'm going to write. And I needed a lot of distance uh, from the experience in order to think about it through the, through the mind of a child, through the eyes of a pre-adolescent, a teenager, a young adult. Later, I'm a mother and have children of my own. And so the voice changes, the thinking changes. There's an evolution that goes on. And in order to capture it all, I really needed perspective. So yes, I needed that. Uh, also, I come from a culture that says women don't do this. You know, it doesn't matter that I'm educated. I am educated, but the voice of Mashad is very much inside of me. And it's basically saying you dare not. And so to defy that voice, I had to channel my mother. Uh, because she was the one who represented defiance. Um, and, and so I did, but uh, it required a lot of work. I worked on it for five years, seriously, using all my free time, um, wrote it, rewrote it, revised it, changed the order, included, extracted, constantly reshaping it, uh, wanting to give it a narrative flow and wanting it to have significance and for it to be meaningful. So it was, it was quite an undertaking. We're so glad you did. <laughs> and and um, what a success that you made. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I know in my own life, uh, my siblings always felt as if when we're talking about uh, how we were raised, we always feel as if we were raised in, in although the same house, it was, we have completely different stories as we look back. So I'm wondering as your brothers looked at this book, did they, did they have the same memories? Did they share those memories or did they have a completely different reality of your parents? Well, firstly, we can sit and laugh over certain memories, experiences that we all had at the same time. And yes, there are bits and pieces of our childhood that we shared. Uh, and so there's that commonality. But as you pointed out, you know, every sibling has a different mother and has a different father. We do not share the same parents because it depends on whether you're male or female, your birth order, where your parents were at the time, both emotionally, psychologically, financially in their lives. And there's always a shift. Plus parents react to each child differently based on who that child is. And hopefully they're attuned to that child. So they have to give that child a different kind of recognition. So we don't have the same mother. We don't have the same father. In my case, I have a brother who's 10 years older than me and another brother seven years older than me. And they are male. And there are different expectations in the Iranian world 
when it comes to men. And then here I am, the youngest female born in the United States. Um, and so I am viewed differently and treated differently. So you're right. I mean, there is the, the commonality and there's also the difference. So, um, and my brothers were phenomenal. I write about my brothers and what they were like for me as a child, as a teenager. They just metaphorically put me on their shoulders and said, non-verbally, they said, reach for the stars. And so they were uh, heroic characters in the book. And uh, they continue to be wonderful people. So they are very loving and very supportive and enjoyed the book tremendously. Thank you, thank you. Um, and final question of mine tonight, which of your parents' values and traditions do you find that you yourself pass on to your own children, either willingly or unwillingly? I think what was most important to me and my husband together uh, was the continuity of Judaism. Uh, my parents were crypto Jews uh, and they held on tenaciously, tenaciously risking their lives uh, as did my ancestors prior to them. So yes, I was born here, but I know their story very well. And my husband comes from an Ashkenazi background and he's got his story. And so we each wanted our children to grow up knowing their ancestry, feeling a strong attachment to Judaism, giving them a Jewish education. They, they went through Jewish day schools and we succeeded in that department. Um, they are um, committed Jews and they are learned, they're educated, knowledgeable and, and love their heritage. But that was very important to both of us. That's wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, open this up to, to audience questions. And we have one that already came through in the chat. How were you able to obtain first the required education and later the, the higher education that you received? Well, that is telling me that this person hasn't read the book. <laughs> it's all in the book and I'm hoping you do get it and you do read it. You know, again, the early education, I was born and raised here. So in Kew Gardens, Queens, later in Forest Hills, Queens, and I went to public school because that was the law. Children had to go to school. So my father had to accept that, but he really didn't want me to become educated. And so it was a bind. Um, I was forging his signature on my report cards beginning with first grade. And I would write his signature, never show him my report card because I was so afraid I was doing so well. And I knew he would be furious, absolutely furious. So I had the opposite, you know, I had friends who were forging because their signature, because their report cards were horrendous and they didn't want their parents to see. And I'm doing the exact same thing because mine were good. Uh, so there was this need to hide myself. You know, the title concealed is not just about my parents concealing themselves. It's about how I grew up concealing myself. And that theme continued into the next generation. Um, and how I got into college was a, is a story. I mean, I, I write about it and it, I had to, I sent applications to colleges behind his back. I forged his signature. I went on interviews behind his back. I didn't know what the hell I was doing because I knew that I couldn't pay the tuition. I was applying to uh, Radcliffe and Brandeis and Hunter, I'm trying to think where, yeah, and Barnard, of course, Barnard. And um, I was accepted into Barnard. Uh, at that time, it was an all girls, well, it still is an all girls school, but at that time, uh, it was a difficult school to get into. I'm sure it still is, but I think it was harder back then because Columbia was an all boys school. Now Columbia is co-ed. And so if you wanted to go to Columbia, you went to Barnard. Um, and so I don't wanna to give too much away, but it was a wild story as to what happened when I got in uh, 
moment because my father went on a suicidal hunger strike. And his belief system was that an educated girl turns into a prostitute. And he was ready to mourn uh, the loss of his one and only daughter. Um, so the rest I will, I will just leave unsaid. <laughs> Um, we have another uh, in the chat. Do you think your dad's desire for silence in the house was due mostly to the crypto Jew culture or to his personality? I think it was due to the way he was raised. His father was a very difficult man and he was um, obsessed with silence. Uh, my father was one of seven children and they all had to tiptoe and not breathe a word. Uh, and that's what my father knew. As much as it was difficult for him, that's what he then repeated. Uh, so a lot of it was the home he grew up in, for sure. Um, I think it's the way he interpreted being a crypto Jew. I, I can't say that all Jews from Mashhad uh, had this reverence for silence. I cannot say that. But my father's way of interpreting life was that the less you say, the safer you are. And um, language only leads to violence. This, this was a, a thought he would often express. And it was, what, it was the way he integrated his life, not necessarily the way all the Mashadi Jews did. Do we have other questions? If you can uh, raise your hand or, and remember you're on mute. Joan, I see Joan Zuckerman. I don't know that you can answer this. I, I thoroughly enjoyed your book, but I continually thought about, and, and you weren't there, the, the young children who were, who were in Mashad, how, how did the parents keep them from, the, the really young children, how did they keep them from divulging that they were being brought up Jewish? Well, first of all, when you're one, two, three years old, this is not a topic. Um, right, but when you're six, seven, eight years old, you can say something to a friend innocently and boom. But they lived in terror. And so these children at a very young age understood that they had to not say a word. They saw their fathers parading around like Muslims and their mothers pretending they were Muslim. And there was always this discussion as to, you're going to be killed if we come out and say, we're just, I mean, they understood. And I think these children grew up very quickly. I think my brothers, you know, as you know from the book, uh, were very mature little children. Yes. Premature, you know, prematurely mature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with that kind of upbringing, having to collude, having to be part of this underground secret, um, having to be more grown up uh, and leave childhood behind and uh, become more responsible and more thoughtful because their lives were at stake. So I, I think it had a lot to do with um, I think it, it really affected the way they grew up. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Carol, you had your hand up. Yeah. First of all, I want to tell you, I really loved your book. It was a, a great read. Um, I, in your book, you have a picture of your mother and father with the, sh the last Shah of Iran. Do you remember that picture? And I was wondering how, and, and I know you were in New York, you know, all your life, but what did you hear about changes, if there were any, in the Jewish community in Iran after the Shah, you know, took power, that Shah? The Jews loved the Shah. They loved him. He, he was a modern thinker. Uh, he was very protective of the Jews. Uh, he was the one that insisted women take the black chadars off. Uh, that children go to school. He was trying to modernize the country perhaps too quickly, uh, but the Jews loved him. Uh, again, my family lived in the city of Mashhad, and this was a fanatically, fanatically Islamic city that turned its back to the Shah. 
and basically felt that he was a heretic. Uh, and these were the fundamentalists coming out of Mashhad. Uh, so my parents didn't feel safer living in Mashhad, but when they moved to Tehran, they did feel safer. Um, but he was, he was deeply respected by the Jewish community. Thank you. Steve, I think you had a question. Steve Pollack. I mute. Thank you. Hi, Helene. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm, I have started to read your book, but I haven't finished it yet. But uh, I, I'm anxious to continue with the story. Uh, and what I wanted to ask was, we know your father obviously didn't accept your mother's behavior. Uh, I mean, that's even too, too uh, you know, limited a way to even express his, I, I can't even imagine, you know, his, his, uh, his philosophy and his upbringing, uh, you know, what he would have thought about what your mother was doing, but yet uh, he never really, fr from what I've seen so far, he never really tried to physically stop her from doing these things, which I imagine he, he could have done had he chosen to do that. So I'm wondering, you know, how, how did he manage to accept, you know, the things that she was doing? And was there any history of, of physical abuse in the family between them, or, you know, their relationship? And, and is, the, is any kind of physical abuse something, a, a common issue with the other Iranian families? Well, I can only talk about my own family. So I, I can't talk about other families, but he was never physical with her. She was rather violent towards him. I mean, there were times when she'd reach for fly, uh, frying pans and I felt like she was gonna smack him over the head and she'd be chasing him. Uh, she would reach for a broom and try to swat him. She had an umbrella, she poked him in the forehead. She was the violent one, but he never laid a hand on her. Um, to explain, you know, it, it was very interesting to watch this growing up because my father was a very traditional, strong, dogmatic man, and she outmuscled him. She outmuscled him. She was 20 years younger, a child bride, um, yet her character was so strong and she just followed her whims and her whimsies and her impulses. Um, she ran away from home a lot. You know, that's in the book. Uh, she used to run away when they lived in Iran. I heard stories about that. Uh, from many people. She even acknowledged it when she told me stories that she would run away from my father. And then in the United States, when I was born, I have tons of memories of her running away. That terrified him. She had ways of terrifying him. Uh, so she had the upper hand. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Alex? Uh, I have read the book and I agree with Carol. It's a wonderful book. Thank you very much and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I wanted to follow up on something you uh, alluded to uh, briefly earlier, which was uh, the, the multiple uh, layers of the title of the book, Concealed, and how it applied to, uh, to your parents and to your ancestors, but also uh, to you as well. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to enlarge on that a little bit and perhaps tie it into the fact that you ended up being a psychotherapist. Is that in any way related to this concealed thing? Oh, definitely. No question about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, they were concealed. They lived their lives, even in the United States, concealed. My father, for sure, felt he had to hide, felt he had to hide from the outside world. If the doorbell rang, 
he would freeze. Uh, if the phone rang, he'd pick it up and say, no one's at home and slam it. Uh, there was such a terror of the outside world. And my mother, even though she was a strong character and uh, she seemed fearless, that's how she lived her life, she was also hiding parts of herself. There was no question. I mean, that Oscar de la Renta story, if she goes in there and pretends that she owns a boutique, you know, this comes from, I believe, from her life of duplicity. And she had mastered that duplicity. Again, hiding her true self and pretending to be someone other. Um, so that whole theme of concealment later with me having to conceal my true self, my interests, my aspirations, my wishes, my speech, having not to speak um, was another layer of concealment. Uh, and I, I think coming from all of that and because I was a very curious child and a very attentive child, I paid a lot of attention to what people were saying and doing and their body language and what they weren't saying because I was struggling with trying to make sense out of the chaos. Um, I think that whole wish to understand what's being hidden, what's underneath, what is the truth uh, has a lot to do with the profession I finally entered, absolutely. Additional questions? Is that this is not a question, this is just a quick comment because from to something that you said, which must be something uh, in our DNA as, uh, as Jews who are always running away. Uh, I had an aunt who lived in Queens in Forest Hills. Now we come from Central Europe, we are not from Iran, but the funny thing that kind of struck me is uh, one day our son went to visit her and she lived in an apartment building and you had to be buzzed in to get in. And so he tried to buzz and nothing happened. So he took his phone, his cell phone and called her up. And before he could say anything like, hi, this is, you know, your, your nephew let me in. She slammed the phone, she yelled, this is the police. And then she slammed the phone down. <laughs> so this must be something in our DNA. Absolutely. Not trusting the outside world. <laughs> yeah. Still, I found it fascinating reading about your mom. And while she may not have been educated, she knew more about human nature and was a student of human nature. And she could, she could manipulate people because she understood them so well. I, I, I thought it was really quite a tribute to your mother, the way you wrote her in that in your memoir. Well, I, I'm glad you felt that way. You know, I, uh, it was meant to be a tribute to both of them, to both of them. You know, I certainly, I certainly show you who they were. You know, I, I don't, I don't pretty it up. I want it to be honest. I want it to be authentic, but um, they were wonderful people in their own way. You know, as a child, I felt I was terrified of my father. Uh, later in life, I grew to understand him and deeply value him. Uh, so there's a whole process that takes place throughout the book. And in my, in my heart of hearts, it was really meant to be a tribute to them, to the Jews of Meshad, who the Ashkenazi world does not know about, and this is not their fault. This is because we haven't written our story. And to give voice to those women who were kept voiceless, who weren't allowed to enter a classroom, who could never tell their story, write it, share it. Um, it was meant for them as well. Thank you. Judy, your hand is up. And you're on mute. No? Judy, you're on mute. I think maybe, I don't think she has a question. Oh, okay. Um, anyone else? Well, 
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Just another question. Um, it fascinated me when you talked about your father's life in Mashhad, um, how he went to London and studied and then, then came back, but also as an adult, how he was a merchant and was able to go to the Bukharan community and sell his goods. So it almost seems like a very, um, you know, in, in one way he was a crypto Jew, but he got out and about in communities where the Jews were you know, able to express themselves. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm not clear as to what the question is because you know, he, he, he was sent to London. He was there for two years. Um, he was still a very withdrawn man, a young man who did not want to be educated. So in a way he held on to himself. He loved the clothing. He loved, he was a dapper of a dresser and, uh, and he loved London, but he still was very insulated. Um, yes, doing business, this is what the Mashadi Jews did. They were merchants when he came back to Mashhad. Many of them went back and forth to Afghanistan, trading goods. This is what they did. So he was part of a community of men who did that. Um, it's, it's really learning. I, I think they learned because, uh, learned, I think it was in their DNA after all these generations, how to live both lives, you know, how to live an inside interior life and an exterior life, um, which is foreign to Americans. You know, Americans are straight as an arrow. Uh, what you see is what you get. This is not the way the Mashadi Jews lived. What you see is not what you get. It was a whole that you had to live a life of duplicity. And so that became part of character. Thank you. That's very different, I think, from the Tehrani Jews, who seem like a, a completely different personality type. Yes, I think that really needs to be highlighted because very often people will say, well, that's not true. You know, I have these friends from Tehran and, and it's a different ball of wax. The girls who were growing up in Tehran, the capital of Iran, at the same time as my mother were, and these are girls coming from affluent families, were being sent to Swiss boarding schools. And after that, maybe sent to the Sorbonne in Paris. They, education was encouraged uh, they were not getting married at the age of nine. It was a whole nother world. And in Mashhad, uh, they were kept illiterate and they were child brides. So an important question is always, what city did you come from? Because the city makes all the difference. It's fascinating. And really, thank you so much for showing us a picture of, a, of Jews from, a, from a really another world. We, we're so used to, I think, being kind of Ashkenazi centric. Yes. And, um, <clears throat> and it's important to look at the diversity of Judaism and it's a different culture completely. Absolutely. So thank you for giving us a window into that. Of course, of course. So thank you so much. We really uh, appreciate your coming tonight. And uh, I think everyone is, is uh, you know, we'd like to give you just a hand for. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, I do have a request, those of you who have read the book and loved it, only if you've loved it, if you could consider giving it five stars on Amazon and on Goodreads, and I'll tell you why. Before I became a writer, I had no idea how this world operates, and uh, Amazon has tremendous power. So the more a book receives five stars, the more they will promote it and make sure readers read it. And I would love to have not only the Jewish world, but the secular world to read it and know the story of the Mashadi Jews. Um, so it would be your way of propelling it into the universe by giving it five stars, both on Goodreads and on Amazon, something to think about. Thank you, thank you very much. I, if I can um, stop you for just a moment, we have one more question from Gloria. I'm sorry, I missed your mm -hmm. hand up before. 
Yeah, uh, I had a question. Um, your mother um, valued independence and she was always striving to be independent. But, and she wanted you to be educated, but only to a certain point. Was it her fear or was it just um, her old world ideas that were clashing with her wanting to be in the modern world? That's a good question. It was very complicated. Uh, she didn't want me to be educated. Uh, she wished that she could read and write and she often would bemoan the fact that she was illiterate and, uh, and that had a big impact on me. I felt very responsible for her in that department. Uh, but I was always confused. Like if that she felt that way, why didn't she want me to? Why didn't she want me to be educated? And this is something I wrote about in the book. You know, I, I grew up feeling this isn't coming together. I don't get it. And what I, I think, because what changed was that chapter when I wrote about Barnard and how she would come and visit me in the dormitories. And she was wonderful when she came. She was a Persian anti-mame. She'd be wearing her Oscar de la Renta outfits and she'd be bedecked with jewels and wearing spike heels and have her makeup in place and come in there and charm all of my roommates. They adored her. She was hysterical. She had a wild sense of humor. And um, she was very supportive of me. And she would come and visit me every, every Tuesday and take me out for lunch when my father had turned his back and wasn't on speaking terms with me because I was in the dorms. But she kept the tie going. And it was only then that I realized what this was all about. You know, I realized that she came from a world where she never saw girls go to school, no less go off to college and live in a dormitory. This was something so foreign and she had no idea what comes out the other end. It's not as if she saw girls go through that tunnel, come out the other end, uh, not turn into prostitutes, <laughs> marry children, ethical, moral lives. She didn't see that. And so when my father would talk about prostitution all the time, like she started to think like, maybe he knows something I don't know. I don't know what happens with this system. So she wouldn't back me. And um, it was only when I was at Barnard where I suddenly felt her support. And I think she was beginning to see that he was wrong. Uh, it doesn't have to turn out that way. Uh, but I think she was torn. I think she was, she couldn't articulate this. She never said to me, I'm conflicted. Um, I'm afraid that your dad may be right. But that's why I'm not backing you. She just would go silent when the topic would come up. And that was unlike her also, because she was vocal. And so I felt betrayed for many years. I felt betrayed and felt that she didn't want the best for me. And later I realized that wasn't the correct interpretation. Uh, she wanted the best for me, but she didn't know if that was the best. So thank you um, once again. I, I can't thank you enough for coming tonight. And I can promise you that you will be getting some five-star reviews on Great. Amazon. Great. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure to be with all of you. So thank you for the invitation. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, thank I you should tell much. you that, that uh, this is being recorded and it will be on the Bethel Yardley archive page. If you are getting uh, emails from me regularly, then you know that you're on the mailing list for the Bethel Book Club. If you are, would like to be on the Bethel Book Club mailing list, I just put in the chat. The, uh, the way to get on it, just email adult ed at bethelyardley.org and you will be put on there and you will get a notification as to when this is up on our, our archive page and where to find it. Thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it very much. Our next book club book is going to be in December. Is it December? Uh, our, it's going to be Premonition. I think it's by Michael Lewis. I think it's November. November 18th or something, I think. 
November 18th, excuse me, you're right, Joan, thank you very much. <laughs> Premonition by Michael Lewis, and our uh, book club discussion leader is going to be Alex Geiger. So please come by and uh, enjoy it. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.